Who are the seven angels? The seven angels are just one of several images that appear in chapter one of Revelation. We also have the seven churches, the seven lampstands, seven spirits. When reading Revelation, it can be really difficult to make sense of all of these different images. So in this video, I'm gonna help you to understand what each one of them means, as well as break down for you the context, history, and other details that will allow you to better understand the book of Revelation and see it with an entirely new set of eyes. So grab your Bible and a pen, and let's dive into this episode of Beyond the Words. The very first word in Revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis. This is significant. With this opening word, John is telling us something about the content of this letter and the style in which it's written. He's letting us know that this is a book about the battle between good and evil, written in the apocalyptic style, and this is how we need to interpret it. In fact, if you want to learn more about apocalyptic literature and some other essential things that you'll want to know before reading books like Daniel and Revelation, just click this link right up here. Now, as we progress through the first chapter, it's going to become very clear why it is so important for us to know this detail about the style of the letter. Some of the things that we're going to read will seem strange or confusing. In fact, the early church almost didn't put Revelation in the Bible because they thought that it was so hard to understand. But when we look at it through this lens of the apocalyptic style, and when we understand the context in which it was written, what was happening back then, we can better understand what John is trying to say to us. And this becomes evident in just the first few verses. In verse 3 of chapter 1, John says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud, and blessed are those who hear the words of the prophecy and observe the things written in it, because the time is near. Now, when John talks about hearing the words and reading them aloud, He's telling us something about how people would have heard Revelation back then. Revelation was written as a letter by John to churches throughout the Roman Empire. When a letter like this would arrive in a particular town or city, the church in that area would come together and hear the letter read aloud to everyone. People would not have had individual copies. The community listened together. And the person reading it would expand or interpret or answer questions wherever necessary. But something else we should know is just how dangerous it was for them to do this. John's audience was being persecuted for their faith. Domitian was an emperor of the Roman Empire and he had a particular dislike for Christians. He declared that he was the Dominus et Deus, which means the Lord and God. He commanded communities to burn incense to him as a god in their local temples. And when people like Christians refused, he said that if they didn't do it, he would take steps to prevent them from buying and selling in local marketplaces. In other words, he tried to starve them into worshiping him. He couldn't stand that people would worship anyone else. Which is going to be a big problem when you see some of the things that John says about Jesus later on in this letter. So by reading these letters aloud in churches and spreading them throughout the Roman Empire, Christians were committing treason. They were putting their lives at risk. Clearly, they think this message is worth suffering and dying for. So what is this message? Well, in the latter half of verse 3, John says something that answers this question, but also might mislead us. John says that we are hearing the words of prophecy. Now, prophecy is a word that can often confuse us because 2,000 years later, we tend to imagine prophecy as a prediction of the future. But that wasn't necessarily how people saw it in the first century. And that's generally not how this word is used in scripture. Sometimes prophets do predict future events, but that wasn't their primary purpose. Prophets are not fortune tellers. Prophets are those sent to deliver a message from God to God's people. And predictions of things like the end of time weren't really relevant concerns for the Israelite people. They focused more on the end of an age. Ages were periods of time that had a beginning and an end. It could be a short period of time or a long period of time. But when that age ended, a new age began. 
And often the current age was a period of persecution followed by a new age when God's people would be free of that persecution. This is one of those moments that shows us how important it is to understand the context of a passage. Context allows us to understand the mindset of both the author and the audience. It impacts the way that we interpret events and even the way that we define words. But in addition to context, there's something else that's critical to our understanding of scripture, especially in books like Revelation. And that something else is style. Like I said, Revelation is written in the apocalyptic style. And here's a great example of where we see that. In verse 4, John says, To the seven churches in Asia, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Now, at first glance, we might feel like we have a sense of who those seven churches are. But what about the seven spirits, right? What does that mean? Well, in apocalyptic literature, the number seven suggests maturity or completion or fruition. So when John says to the seven churches in Asia, he means to all of the churches, right? The whole church, the complete church. And the same sort of thing is true with the seven spirits. Seven spirits refers to the complete spirit. It's a reference to the Holy Spirit. And just in case you're doubtful about this, the number seven was used in this way a long time before Revelation. We see it used this way in Leviticus. Jesus uses seven this way when talking about forgiveness. This image of seven spirits is John's way of telling us that this message is coming to him through the Holy Spirit. This isn't his message, it's the Lord's message. It isn't just for a few churches, it's for all churches. And when we see what this message is, we realize why people are willing to die so that everyone can hear it. John tells us that this message comes from the quote, firstborn of the dead, which is a reference to Jesus' resurrection. He says it comes from the one who is the quote, ruler of kings, meaning that Jesus is not subject to the emperor. And John says that it comes from the one who is quote, coming in clouds. This is a phrase that Jesus himself used. It's a phrase from Daniel that refers to the moment when God will put an end to the persecution of God's people. So from the outset, John is saying, I know what you're going through, but I want to tell you right away that God is going to get rid of those who are causing your persecution. The whole church needs to hear this message. It is worth suffering for. And beginning in verse 9, John reveals to us how he himself is suffering. Before that, though, please take a moment to go down below and click the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you're liking this video. If you're with us for the first time today, welcome. And if you've seen our videos before, then welcome back. By clicking those buttons, you help us to reach even more people like yourself, enabling them to understand scripture like never before and see it with an entirely new set of eyes. So please take a moment to click those buttons and thank you so much for your support. Now, let's hop back into our lesson. So as we enter verse nine, John begins to tell us more about how he is suffering for the gospel. He calls himself a co-sharer in the affliction. He recognizes the persecution that these churches are facing and he wants them to know that he is suffering too. He tells us that he is in exile on Patmos. This was an island that Rome would put people on that they wanted to get rid of, but they didn't want to kill. They were afraid that if they killed these people, they'd become martyrs. But if they exiled them, then they might be forgotten. Nevertheless, even though John is suffering in isolation, he doesn't give up. He uses every tool at his disposal to promote the gospel. In fact, over the next few verses, John makes it very clear that one of the tools at his disposal is that he is exceptionally well-versed in the Hebrew scriptures. Verse after verse, he references various Old Testament passages. Some scholars actually estimate that there are anywhere between 500 and 1500 scripture references in Revelation. A great example of this comes between verses 13 and 16. In just these few verses, John references Daniel multiple times, as well as Exodus, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. In the midst of this, John also tells us more about who he is writing to. He identifies who the seven churches are that he mentioned earlier. Now, as we said, these seven churches are meant to represent all churches, 
But the fact that he names them also may tell us something. Perhaps these seven churches are highlighted because they have issues that are representative of the issues that churches are facing more broadly. In other words, when you look closely at them, you get a glimpse of the church as a whole. Additionally, when you look closely at how John lists these churches, you see a pattern. The order in which these seven churches appear is not random. It actually makes a lot of sense. Ephesus is mentioned first, and it's also the first city that a person would reach when they were sailing to this region from Rome. After Ephesus, John mentions the next closest city, Smyrna, then Pergamos, then Thyatira, then Sardis, and so on, forming a circular route around the region. These churches encompass this region just as they encompass all of Christianity. What they are facing is what all churches are facing. But there's good news. Because finally, after John has told us about himself and the churches, he tells us something important about Jesus. Jesus tells John, do not be afraid. I am the Alpha and the Omega and the one who lives. And I was dead and behold, I am living forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and of Hades. To a people living in persecution, these are powerful words. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Jesus is declaring that he is eternal, all-powerful. He goes on to say that he holds the keys of death and Hades. And that last word is actually really important for us to understand. In Greek culture, Hades was the place where all of the dead went. It wasn't associated with hell as we think of it, right? A place of punishment. So when Jesus says that he holds the keys to death and Hades... And we realize that to hold the keys to something means that you have authority over that thing. We can see that this statement really means this is Jesus' way of saying that he determines who lives and dies. This is a bold statement, right? This is the sort of thing that could get John and anyone possessing this letter in serious trouble. The emperor claimed to have authority over life and death. Rome determined who lived and who died. This is seditious language, but John knows that people need to hear it. In these words, John is saying, you've been persecuted, you're suffering, but the emperor isn't the one who truly controls life and death. Jesus does. You don't have to be afraid of him because Jesus is in control. And it is with all of that in mind, that we can finally understand all of these other images that John has been saying along the way, like how at one point John mentions seven lampstands, right? The image of a lampstand is a reference to the menorah. Rather than seven prongs, John says that it is seven lampstands. And at that point in history, the menorah had come to represent the Jewish people. John is expanding that image. He's saying that it now includes the church. Christians have been grafted into God's family. Later on, he mentions seven stars. Now on one level, seven stars could be a reference to a coin honoring Domitian's deceased son. Not long before this letter was written, Domitian's young son died, and Domitian had coins minted depicting his son as an infant version of Zeus playing with the stars. He did this to declare that his son would reign among the stars because he had lost his opportunity to reign on earth. John could be using this familiar image to tell his audience that Jesus will reign. But there's also another meaning to these stars. John tells us that the seven stars are angels. Well, in apocalyptic thought, people believed that each nation, or even just a group of persons, had a guardian angel. John wants his audience to know that Jesus is watching over the church. The one who controls death, Jesus, will protect all Christians. He already defeated death when he rose from the dead just three days after his crucifixion. And if he can defeat death, there is no one on this earth who can defeat him. To people starving and suffering for the gospel, these are much needed words of hope and assurance. This first chapter offers bold words of encouragement. But this opening chapter also does something else for those of us reading this book thousands of years later. In these first 20 verses, John is setting the tone for the rest of the letter. He wants to be clear on who he's writing to and why he's writing. He intends for us to see things through the lens of persecution and apocalyptic literature. He wants whoever reads this 
to know that things will be okay. Rulers might try to harm them. Food may be scarce. Worship might be risky. But Jesus is in control. Jesus is Lord in the end. Jesus rose from the dead. He is the last word on death. And no matter how bad things may get, no matter what comes next, he will be with us. This age of persecution will end and a new age will come. And he will be there to see us through. For some of you, these are words that you've been needing to hear today. You're in a season of persecution. Or maybe food is scarce. Worship is dangerous. And rulers are destroying your life as you know it. For others of you, you're in a season of death. Relationships are dying. Your health is fading. Some important doors have been closed in your life. Maybe you're part of a church that still hasn't come back together or still hasn't reopened. But what John wants you to hear is that this is not the end of the story. Your enemies don't have the last word. Your diagnosis doesn't have the last word. Your fear doesn't have the last word. COVID doesn't have the last word. Jesus does. And you can put your hope in him. If he can defeat death, then there is no ruler, no challenge that he cannot overcome. He's not promising that there won't be pain along the way. But he does promise to see you through. And I want to pray for you to experience that today. Now make sure to stick around after the prayer so that you can hear more about what's coming up in this series. But for right now, let me pray for you. Oh Lord, we thank you that you are not a God who abandons us in the midst of our affliction. But through Jesus, we see that you are a God who takes on affliction for us. And so Lord, we put our hope in you today to free us from the bonds of persecution, to revive what is dead in our lives, to save us in the way that only you can. We put our faith in you, Jesus, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings, and the one coming in clouds. We trust that if you can overcome the grave, you can overcome this and bring us into a new age, a season free from persecution where you reign in our hearts and in this world. And so, Lord, it is in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Okay, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Now, in our upcoming videos, we're going to be looking at Daniel 2, where we will break down everything happening as Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. And we'll also be looking at Revelation 2, where we will explain what Jesus is saying in his letters to the seven churches. You're not going to want to miss them. So go ahead and click on the links right over here that will take you to another video in this series. And until then, thank you so much for watching, have a great week, and God bless.